Hello and welcome to another episode of the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. But no, things got a little bit hairy in the sense I got, um, I was mugged at knife point and at gunpoint in Lagos in Nigeria. Um, I had some big cat incidents where I got very, very close to some big animals in the wild um, by accident. Uh, I also was hit by a car. Um, I was shot at, I was put in a cell. I had a minor heart attack. I was attacked by dogs. You name it, basically. Uh, but two, nearly two years around the world, that's what you get. Um, On today's show, we have Nick Butter, an ultra marathon runner who ran a marathon in every country around the world. On today's show, we talk about his experience and the sort of logistical nightmare that goes in to an 18 month expedition like this. We talk about some of the crazy trips from Turkmenistan to his insane story about being used as a drug mule getting through to the Yemen without knowing, but we have him. And I am delighted to introduce Nick Butter to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to chatting things, uh, all things adventure. No, yeah, thank you. Well, you've had quite the adventure. I mean, a marathon in all 196 countries over 18 months. I mean, that just sounds unbelievable from probably picturesque mountains to war zones. I mean, there's, mm. there's quite a lot to cover, but I suppose probably the best place to start is with you and how you got into running and this sort of lust for adventure. Yeah, of course. So I guess, I guess running, you, everybody does it by accident sometimes, whether you're running for a bus or running to the fridge or whatever it may be. But I guess you just take it that next step further. Everybody goes through the cycles of running for fitness and running for them for enjoyment and then to compete. And then it goes that step further. And I obviously ran and make it made it my job, I suppose. Um, but running for me is is about the endorphins, the peace, the calm, the serenity of moving through a country slowly at what is effectively walking pace, just a little bit quicker. Um, and so it's a little bit more efficient and you get to see things. You know, I think it's quite different from cycling or whether you're going in a car, because you do see stuff that um, otherwise you'd miss, uh, as you know. So. Um, Running is very special. I guess I got into it properly uh, when I started to do normal races, just the odd new marathon here and there. And then I thought, oh, I'm not bad at this. Maybe do a, do a bit of a longer race. And so I did a did, did an ultra and then I went and did, did pretty well, then won a few and won a few more and then raced and raced and raced. And then kind of almost exhausted racing um, to the point that at that point, brands were saying to me, would you like to come and do this race or do this race? Or And I had to actually turn lots down because I was working I had a real job I was in finance and so I had to give up my banking job to, to be a runner and that's not what a lot of people do um, and so I understood though that on one hand I was you know, filling the bank and on the other hand I was kind of degrading the the soul <laughs> the soul bank if you like so um, uh, it was just a better matter of balancing it and for running it was it was such an escape through the stresses of work and i think everybody does that anybody that's, that's, that enjoys running and i think you have to get to that stage where you enjoy running then it's complete escapism and you can one minute you can be listening to a, a fiction book about something you you completely mystical and you can be off in your own head uh and then the other you can be focused on your run and it's it's absolutely brilliant and then i i gave up my job and, and started running and uh and eventually we we came to this point where i wanted to run a marathon in every country in the world um and amazingly, we did it. Um, the people close to the trip will will say and will know quite how bad it was to get to the finish. Um, I was the only one. I travelled on my own but uh, most of the time. Um, but the people that were planning it, we honestly, for months, we really didn't think we were going to finish. Um, so, yeah, so I suppose that's the, that's the story of me, um, runner, and then you just kind of keep on running. <laughs> so what was the kick that sort of because I, I can't imagine sort of comes to everyone to do this sort of trip what really propelled you to do this 196 marathons was there something that sort of triggered it because i i usually find there is always a trigger that sort of says yeah. i need to do this i don't think there is one trigger i think it, this the particular example was the the last final trigger 
you know, it's almost like a series of pushes towards the edge of the cliff. And this one push was the one that you know, popped me over the edge. Um, and that was meeting this guy called Kevin. Um, I ran the, the Marathon de Saab race out in the, the Moroccan Sahara Desert, um, obviously grueling race, tents of, uh, I think it's about, I don't know how many tents there are, but there's a thousand people that take part, um, tents of eight. And, uh, and one of these guys was Kevin. Kevin was 49 at the time happy, generally normal looking bloke, quite tall, massive smile, just a jolly bloke. And we got chatting about running and stuff. And then he told me that he had terminal prostate cancer. And I said, hang on a minute, what? You? And he said, yeah, I'm, I've potentially only got two years to live. And it was completely out of the blue. And it was almost saying like, he was I don't know, just going to buy a new car or something. And I was, whoa. And, and then I realized over many hours of him speaking and then weeks afterwards of finishing that race and going back and kind of dwelling on what he was talking about. You know, during that conversation, he said, don't wait for a diagnosis. Don't wait for something to happen for you to completely follow your dreams. And he said, even though the, even there's lots of people out there that believe they're following their dreams or living their life to the full when they're actually making excuses of why they don't do lots of stuff. And so he said, just, you know, try and start again, like uh, have a nice blank canvas and write down what you want to do. And obviously wanted to raise some money for prostate cancer after meeting him. And then I thought, well, what better way than to listen to his advice? And I was already running. I already had a, a you know decent beginnings of a running career. Um, but he kind of opened up the opportunity for me to, to combine all of my passions, photography, running, uh, meeting people, traveling the world, you know, and this was this was all of a sudden a way to incorporate raising some money for prostate cancer, prostate cancer UK. Um, and so I dreamt the idea up after Googling it, realized nobody had done it um, and thought, right, well, we have to do that. And at the time, I didn't even know how many countries there were. Uh, and it took, it took a long time to get to the start line, um, to two years. And in those two years, there was lots of, you know, finding the finances, understanding the logistical challenges. Um, wasn't intentional two years. I thought it would make, maybe take a month. Um, it just took lots of time to get right. And then eventually we were ready to go on January the 6th, 2018. Um, and 674 days after that. So uh, 23 months after I started, we crossed the finish line eventually. Well, yeah, it sounds like a complete logistical nightmare with it. You know, you've got 196 countries, so many visas, so many countries which would probably, you know, reject your visa just because they want to, whether it's a war zone or whether it's uh, political reasons. So to get 196 must have just been incredible, but at the same time, very stressful. Um, yeah. How did you do it? How do we do it? People, I think. Uh, people are at the heart of everything. Any, any adventurer or traveler will tell you that, that it is all about the people. Um, and I think I believe that when people said, oh, you're going to meet so many people, it'll change your life. And, and I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but now I realize, I get it, like the people of the world, human beings are just fundamentally so special, like unbelievably, unfathomably special. Um, and uh, I got to see that every, every, every walk of life, basically. Um, and they propelled me around the world. So the answer is how we did it with, with a lot of help from my friends, I guess. Um, and talk about visas, a particular company called Universal Visas worked out all of my visas for me. Um, we thought we'd need about 220 flights. We ended up needing 455 flights. Um, we thought we'd need about two or three passports. We ended up needing nine. Um, and it was just this massive mess of, oh, yeah, I've planned this well to, I have done a really bad job at planning this. This is hard now. Uh, and we ran out of money after the first few months. And it, you know, I wrote it in the book, you know, the spiral of just the stresses of making sure we we're being able to continue. Because, you know, once you start, you can't just stop and start again because there's a hell of a lot to do. Um, and we were running, what, three marathons in three different countries every week for 96 weeks, give, you know, averagely. Um, and with that pace, you don't have any time to, anybody that's done some decent traveling, you'll know you, you rely on, like, it, uh, uh, airports as your like your home basically airports feel the most familiar they have wi-fi they have food um, and everything else in between is just up to you to get by and make it make sure it happen happens and so um, and even airports sometimes let you down so uh yeah it was it was a struggle to get the planning done um but it was a it was a great uh, a great combination of like blissly blissly ignorant 
and completely and utterly naive <laughs> when we went into the planning. And had that not been the case, then I think I would have been too afraid because it was just so complicated. Um, but we, we eventually got there. So 196 countries. Let's start with number one. No, I'm joking. No, <laughs> we'll be here all um, night. <laughs> we can get all of them. But I, I say, when, when, I wrote, uh, when I wrote the book, um, I literally did that. I was, I was going to go, I'm going to do a detailed account of everything. <laughs> and I'll see how long it takes me to do. And the book that is now out is, what, 400 and odd pages, um, nearly 500, I think. But when I the original manuscript was three times bigger. Um, it was like 300 and something thousand words. Um, and we ended up having to cull, cull a lot of my rubbish bits out and put all of the, the essential bits in because there's just so much that happened. Every single country has a story. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. Every country has their own unique sort of spe- specialty and, you know, where where you're traveling or different... Co- there's just so much that you appreciate about each one. It's just that little individuality um, and they're hard to sort of distinguish they're easy to distinguish, but it, you know, 196 to sort of talk about. Yeah. It's feeling people always just say to me, well, how, how can you get to experience a country when you're only there for a couple of days and you're running a marathon? My answer to that is, you know, I'm not experiencing the entire country, but I am very quickly arriving a stranger and then turning into somebody that knows how the customs and the culture operates. So whether that is about religion um, and whether that is about when prayer time happens or what the customs are like about covering up or what side of the road the traffic drives on or if they have traffic lights or not or if they are a country that beeps their horn all the time or if they're a country that likes to be neat and tidy and and have no cars on the roads at all and there's literally it's it's like a a writer's dream because everything is so 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 different and uh comprehensively intricate um it's it's magical well, let's, um, I suppose a couple of years ago, I was out in Central Asia and the Middle East, Turkmenistan, which was a slightly bizarre country I found. What happened there? Because visas are, can be quite difficult mm. to get into that country. And yeah. it's the most bizarre place um, that I think I've ever been to. Um, yeah. for all the weird reasons that no one could really comprehend all the weird reasons i love turkmenistan is is crazy and and it's got its downside as well you obviously the, the rich poor divide in turkmenistan is very very obvious the capital is, is ashgabat obviously where where you experience and the city it is imagine a child has been given a a lego set made of only white bricks and the bricks you have to make towers of massive structures so basically Turkmenistan is a uh, is a model village but on a real scale made of marble the entire city is made of marble and anybody that doesn't know Turkmenistan's laws um, and the the leader uh, of their country is frankly nuts Uh, and they have uh, renamed all of the days of the week after the leader's children, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I think that was right. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I, I think it was the old leader, not the current old, leader. Not leader. No, that's very true. That's very true. The old leader. The old leader. Oh, they're still, the, the, the days of the week are still the same, though, aren't they? They've yeah, been re- but, yeah, yeah, but the current dictator like his, was his old dentist. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's old and obviously he loves he loves horses and there's always the old leader there's statues of him everywhere but it's an unbelievable place because it's utterly clean and it's also completely completely empty you have highways it's like a city for the future like when the world is full we'll spill over into this beautiful country that is ready to ready to live in um <laughs> you've got like a it's almost like a um going back to the lego analogy like this ma- a magical building maze of, of white marble and then on the outskirts, you've got all of the bricks that were kind of discarded and, and it's in, in the, that's where the poor divide begins. And it's quite shocking. And I ran in, in both of those bits. Um, absolutely amazing place. I don't, I, would I say it's the weirdest place? I mean, one, to, one of the weirdest. Um, North Korea is obviously up there, um, but that's got, it actually seems incredibly similar in the sense of uh, cleanliness and scale um, and emptiness. Uh, and the only difference is you, I suppose North Korea feels um a little bit more dark i suppose is the answer like kind of dirt, not dirty but 
um, I guess it's the, the the preconceptions that you bring onto it. You make it make it what that is. But yeah, no, Ashgabat in Turkmenistan was an experience. Um, and it was very hot when I was running as well, actually. Because um, over that hundred and ninety six countries, you must to run a marathon. You know, sometimes were you sort of running along the roads? Were you on the beaches? Were you? Um, because each one must have been so different. I. I sort of heard you had quite a sort of an experience in Syria and Damascus. Could you tell everyone about that? Yeah, Syria. Yeah, you're right. So I, I ran everything from beaches to like lava fields to tar to grass to sand, everything. Um, or monsoon mud in Nepal, actually. Um, but yeah, Syria was a great experience. I um, So the full story is... Uh, this Syria was nearly the end. So I was about 190 countries in to 100 of an 196. Um, and Syria was obviously has its own uh, preconceptions and dangers. And I was going over overland into Syria from uh, Beirut, I believe. Am I getting that right? Yes. From Beirut into Syria to Damascus, Beirut to Damascus. Um, and a few days before my, my dad called me and, and said that, the organization that we had support that had supported us in order to getting get this done there's about 24 different people that managed to link up the safe access into syria it was so difficult because we were going overland and we needed to make sure it wasn't going to be cancelled and i got a call from my dad saying really sorry but your driver who we'd organized months ago to take me into syria from beirut uh, has been shot and killed um on that same drive literally the day before you arrive two days before you arrive um and obviously that's incredibly sad and shocking but also we were then stuck in beirut without our onward travel because we were obviously you know hopscotching from one to the next and so we were a right up the spout and, and i also had a bad feeling about it because there was loads of protests in beirut at the time this was the last uh, 20 was it 2019 october november and um and there was flaming roadblocks everywhere. It was a very hostile experience. And I really thought we were getting into something, you know, it was going to go wrong. But anyway, long story short, we found another driver. We went into Syria, went into Damascus. And I was expecting to feel f- afraid because of everything you see in the news. Um, and actually, I had completely the opposite experience. I was hosted by this brilliant chap uh, who helped me find the hotel that I stayed in, which was a beautiful hotel, absolutely stunning, um, in the middle of the old town. It wasn't just out somewhere in a, in a nice, neat compound. This was a real hotel in the centre of Damascus. And uh, and amazingly, later that day when I ran, I was I ra- ran with the under-19s female national football team, um, who just happened to be training in the stadium where I was going to be starting my run. Um, and we ran around the stadium together. Uh, and then the other football team, the other, the, the boys national team uh, came on, a uh, regional team, sorry, came on and we did a bit of running together. And it would, it would just talk about people and community and that amazing feeling. They made that so unbelievably special because they didn't know I was this nutter from England is going to be running around their, their stadium and their city. Um, and yet they opened, uh, welcomed me with open arms. And I had the most amazing feeling of being such a small piece of such a brilliant world. And, um, it's again when it catches you I tried to as the trip went on I tried to learn to not let my preconceptions kind of yeah give me the experiences and yeah I went into Syria expecting to be afraid because of war um, and I should have known I should have known that something was going to happen because every country I went to that was the same thing uh, all of my preconceptions were wrong um, but no we had the most amazing time in Syria and I, I will never I will never forget that day because it was, as you can imagine, going to every country, there's a handful of countries that you would pull out of the air of that might be tough. Um, and Syria was one of them and it turned out to be one of the most enjoyable. Yeah, I think a lot of what I love about travel is that it does break down preconceptions of different countries. You you see these countries portrayed so badly in Western media sometimes. And, you know, I, when I did my trip, well, it was in Iran, but you suddenly go there and you suddenly find that the locals are just so welcoming and hospitable and they could not have been nicer. And what you see in the media and what you experience are two very different things. Yeah, that's so true. And I've always like, I almost feel like I want to campaign for 
uh, like a good news channel where there's only the good stuff that goes on. Because I'm amazed that there's literally thousands of news channels and all they want to hear about is the bad stuff. When my experience, and no doubt most people that travel a lot, is the experience is there's so much good in the world that goes on everywhere, from every walk of life, from every religion, every race, every continent. There is so much more good than bad. Uh, and what you see on the news is bad stuff. Um, and I understand because that's the system and that's what human beings are you know, expecting to see on the news. Um, I just wish we could mix it up a bit. Um, and I guess your, you know, your platform like this, John, um it's, it's one of those honestly and that's why i love doing these kind of things because it's um it's the, it's the only voice of good in the world isn't it i i sort of agree i mean throughout that i mean you must have had so many countries where it was like that you went there with that sort of fear that something bad was going to happen and then when you got there it's sort of i don't know it's just like you get there and you're just like wow why was I yeah. even fearful? Why did I even build this up in my head to be terrified when actually the reality is just so different from what I was thinking? Yeah, yeah, you're right. And there's also the other side of the coin where I think preconceptions generally are a bad idea because you immediately put yourself in a, an expectation box of, of that. Uh, and it's then very difficult to come out of it. Even like, I don't know, the Bahamas or Cuba all those kind of places that don't strike me as somewhere that I might be fearful of. Yeah, I have preconceptions, like let's say the Bahamas, lovely white beaches, blue sea, bright blue sky and sun. And I was running in the Bahamas and it was torrential rain and floods and overcast and cloudy and windy and horrible. Um, and so once again, my preconceptions that I thought, come on, I can't be wrong this time. I was wrong again. And so whether it's the weather, whether it's the culture, whether it's the political volatility, whether it's wars, whether it's, uh, a random protest in a place there's so many things um and uh yeah it's just it just shows you the wonders of the world i guess and I, I quite like that even though i desperately tried to not let my preconceptions determine what i was expecting um they did up until the the final day where i still do now so i don't know whether i'm going to ever get out of that did um what was the sort of was there a particular moment on your 18 month expedition where you sort of look back and you're, you can pinpoint one moment where you were like, wow, what an amazing moment. Oh, gosh, there's so many like that. Um, I had a, a couple of very moving moments when I was in... Uh, so one was in El Salvador when I ran with a thousand kids in San Salvador in the city. I was kind of planning that, you know, maybe running on my own or maybe the embassy would come out and put a few people out. But the embassy had... Uh, we'd contacted them. They then organised with the Ministry of Support of Sport and the uh, elite athletes and schools in the international schools. Loads of kids coming out waving Union Jack flags and sharing their sharing their story and running with people. Uh, I just had the most overwhelming feeling of just I was like inferior to the moment because it was so so wonderful. Um, and then other moments where one was in um, in Panama when I went to see we did we have visited loads of schools and organizations and running clubs and hospitals and children's hospitals and orphanages and um, basically tried to see as much of the real world as I could and one of these was in Panama and in Panama uh, I went to see a cancer rehabilitation center and a, a rehab center a um uh, a chemotherapy ward sorry um in Panama and there was these old leather chairs with people that were looking uh, quite solemn in their chairs when I walked in and it was an air conditioned room, obviously Panama was very hot um, and I was sweating buckets and they were all, all in there wrapped in jackets with their drips in their arms and, and something most amazing thing where when they finished their uh, chemotherapy session, they go and ring the bell and it's like a sign of, I am still alive and kicking and we're going to beat this. Um, and obviously cancer is so universal and I was doing it for a cancer cause and sat down and had a few chats with these people. Um, it was the most just special moment to experience. Um, and there was lots of tears when we went back because that was mid run. So we then had to carry on running and think about this. And that was very special. Uh, and then there's plenty of other opportunities. One, one in which I, my last example, because there's lots of them, is uh, I was running in the Caribbean somewhere. Uh, and I was run, I ran out of money, ran out of water, and I really desperately needed some water. And I came across a lady who had a tiny little stall with a few bottles of things, like some fuel and fuels in some plastic bottles and some water. Uh, and I said, oh, can I, uh, 
can I can I have a, a, a sip of water? Can I have a cup of water? Um, um, I'll bring you money back another time. I'll bring money back when I finish. And she just said the most simplest thing. She just gave me the bottle of water and said, water is life. And just looked at me as like, you need it. Uh, and this is somebody that has absolutely nothing in comparison to material things that I would, uh, or jobs or opportunities or freedoms. And she's just willingly going, yeah, there you go. That was such a strong correlation wherever I went. The less people had, the more they wanted to give. And I'm sure you've experienced that too. It's the most weird paradox of, of travel um, and the world. And uh, I think those moments will sum up why I have so much admiration for the diversity of the planet. Were there any sort of hairy moments you've had? Because you've must you've crossed quite a few borders, you've quite a few customs. You must have had quite a bit of difficulty here and there. Lots of difficulty. <laughs> I've had quite a few moments where I've forgotten which country I'm flying in from and which country I'm in. Um, a number of times, I'd say at least four specific times where I've been questioned by immigration staff of where have you come from and where are you staying? Uh, and I had no idea. I was, I don't know. <laughs> and I was just so tired. Um, and I was really stumped. You know, when you're in that moment where you know you have the answer, but you just think, I don't know, I don't know. Um, so that was quite embarrassing. But no, things got a little bit hairy in the sense I got, um, I was mugged at knife point and at gunpoint in Lagos in Nigeria. Um, I had some big cat incidents where I got very, very close to some big animals in the wild um, by accident. Uh, I also was hit by a car. Um, I was shot at. I was put in a cell. I had a minor heart attack. I was attacked by dogs. You name it, basically. Uh, but two, nearly two years around the world, that's what you get. Um, yeah. And they were moments which I still look back with a fond memory because you, as everybody knows, the whole point of this kind of endurance and life, I suppose, in general, is you overcome them and then you enjoy overcoming them as well. So, um, no, scary moments, but moments that I can look back with fond memories of, I think. Yeah, I, th I think it all happens to us. Um, you have to experience the bad to appreciate the good. Yeah, absolutely. It's so it's so easy as well to just assume that I always I know I had twenty two different bouts of food poisoning in two in twenty two months, <laughs> and like come on, that's I I thought I might get food poisoning once or twice and it would be horrible, but I got food poisoning a lot, and that was just because I was so run down, my body was depleted, I was also hungry, so I was eating anything, um, and yeah, that that made the uh, the running a little bit more hard. Yeah, I've running marathons on. An empty stomach and food poisoning is just brutal. Oh, it is not a nice feeling running on empty. Uh, running on empty energy-wise, let alone when you're vomiting every mile or where I had kidney infections, I was peeing blood a lot of the time. Um, like the, my body was just wrecked. Um, and all it was, it was a case of just having that tiny little bit of rest between countries where I was on a plane, like my safe places. Um, and if I, was, if I was lucky, I'd be able to get to the airport and they'd have, they'd have air conditioning or they'd have somewhere I could sleep on the floor. Um, so, yeah, the, it's, it's amazing, though. And like you say, you've got to have the, the rough of the smooth. I, I, the logistics of food, I, I found, was really difficult because you sort of plan it. And in these countries, you might sort of see in the, on Google Maps that this is a little town which you'll run through or something. Then when you get there, it's absolutely nothing. Yeah. And so you sort of plan to maybe have your snack or have your lunch there and suddenly there's nothing. And so you're then running on empty for the rest of the day. Yeah, um, that's did you sort of carry a massive backpack with stuff in it or were you just like hotel, drop it off, run, come back? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Most of my equipment was like camera gear and filming stuff. Um, and obviously just a few items of clothing and like, books and pens and things like that but nothing major um so no, i run without anything and i got very good at just finding places um and got quite good at learning that i need to turn around and run somewhere else that's, a, that's the benefit of not doing point to points of the benefit of just running the distance in in a country is means i know if i'm you know if i run three miles in one direction and i don't find anything it's probably safer to run back three miles and drink and then go in a different direction. Uh, because yeah, I got, I got into a few sticky, uh, Iran was a good example where I uh, ran in Kish Island and uh, it was very hot, very early in the morning. And I only had about 12 hours in the country. Um, and 
the guy that was my driver, lovely chap, very friendly, but didn't really understand what I was doing. That's another thing I learned is that the rest of the world doesn't all know what running is as a sport or what marathons are, um, as I'm sure you've experienced. And so I, I said to him, no, I need, need to get water before we go. And he was going to follow me in the car. So this happened quite a few times in countries where I'd have people with water uh, if it was unsafe there. Or, or very hot, which was both in this case. Uh, in this case, and, and he followed me, and he said, oh, "We'll get water around the corner, around the corner." I said, "Okay." We got around the corner, uh, and there's nothing. I said, "Is there water soon?" Because I'm like, it's eight miles now. Like, I need some water. And then more and more miles went by in the same conversation. I was getting quite grumpy with him because I was like, "I really need water now." Um, and uh, I did 24 miles without any water in like 30 odd degrees at like two o'clock in the morning, having only just landed. Um, it was horrendous. Um, and fortunately I managed to, uh, there was a little <laughs> classic travel, I suppose. There was a little um, sort of construction site near a petrol station in the middle of nowhere in Kish. Um, and it had nothing in it apart from a few cables and like some scaffolding and a water cooler. And it had water in it. And I was like, I don't know how long this has been here, but I am having that water. Um, and that was the only way I drank. You know, and that was, that was through the whole marathon. Good. And with these sort of escorts, I mean, I find it slightly embarrassing when you have someone driving behind at sort of four miles an hour, creeping behind you. I mean, it makes you run faster, but you just, you're sort of there running, being like, oh God, the poor person in the back. Just oh, well, watch I'm me not, run. Some people don't know what they're going into either. Because <laughs> I don't think some people, you oh, Nick, you just need to follow Nick for a few hours and he's running a marathon. Um, like if my team had organized it for me, they don't really realize that I'm running at running pace or slower and it's very hot they don't have air con or it might be ramadan that happened many times where you know they're seeing me necking water and eating on my runs and they can't drink or eat um and that's that's brutal uh it's also having cars cars driving behind you is really not very peaceful um so i got used to asking them to either drive ahead or, or wait or something but it was incredibly I, and absolutely needed them because there was many opportunities that I, you know, I, I could have been mugged or lost or all sorts of things had they not been there, and mainly for water, really. And what happened in the Yemen? Yemen, huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yemen, Yemen was another overland journey right near the end. I think marathon number one hundred ninety-one. Maybe I'm right in that new one. Um, I remember the order. Let's say it was close to the end. Running in Yemen, I was going overland from uh, Amman. Um, and it was a few hours in, over the Imani Mountains, gorgeous mountains, dead of night. So kind of sun setting as we got to the border. Um, and the driver that I had was, didn't speak very good English, but was very friendly. Um, picked me up. Uh, little, you know, classic travel things, picked me up from the airport. And then he said, oh, I just have to go over to this garage because I need to pick up a new windscreen. You know, he didn't have a windscreen in this car. Uh, and so pick up a new windscreen, put that in, and then he would take me. Um, and so that was already a bit odd. But then um, we got to the border and it was one of the most, if not the most scary, I'm going to say the most scary moment of my life when I realized we were in this dead of night, lots of military or people with guns and officials with their uniforms and their dogs and stuff surrounding the car. And we were in the middle of the Imani Desert on the, on the Yemen border. And if you look at it on the map, it's just barren, absolutely barren. And, uh, and then we, it dawned on me that the guy that was driving us, he was trying to smuggle in drugs and counterfeit goods into the country. And he was using me effectively as an excuse, as a mule to get these into the country. And I was there in the passenger seat and hearing these conversations in Arabic, which I couldn't understand, but I got the gist that we were in trouble. Um, and fortunately, fortunately, he managed to give, uh, give everything that he had to these guards in order to let us go. But it, it took a long time. And I really didn't know if we were going to get in or if we were ever going to see anybody ever again. They could have just put me in a cell. Um, as you know, there's some countries that don't let you, you know, the, the British government don't have any responsibilities to come and save you because you're a bit of an idiot to go there. Um, and so I, I went and I was genuinely fearful that I was never going to see my family or friends or loved ones again because they were angry. And then I was, everything passed and it subsided and he, the driver was annoyed, but we got into the country uh, and I realized 
ah, I'm in Yemen now and we don't have anything to barter with on the way out and it's going to be the same chaps. Like, are we actually going to leave? Like, are they just, what, what are they trying to pull here? And unfortunately, we didn't have any trouble. Well, I didn't say, we just had to have a lot of patience. I'm sure you've had it. You just have to have like a bucket of patience and then you have to have a loan of like thousands of buckets of patience in order to be able to get through these borders because it's just so slow and just you feel like they're just trying to put every blocker in your way especially when you're tired as well so you just have to be patient and stand there very very quietly um and eventually they let you go um but it was um that was scary that was that was scary after using you as a drug mule did you tip him <laughs> you tip him if i could if i could tip him i would not have tipped him as it happened <laughs> they took all of our money <laughs> so there was no opportunity to tip um there was, you know, the, the story goes on because he, um, this little, we we're supposed to be staying in a hotel before we go, it went over the border. Um, and I was dubious about where this hotel was going to be as we were driving through the mountains because there was nothing like camels and mountains and road and a few cars, very few cars, and that's it. No buildings, no nothing. And we drove past the only kind of building we could see and it was effectively a concrete shell that looked like it has just been bombarded with bullets. And that was where we were staying. It was literally nothing other than concrete and a few broken down walls. Um, and, uh, and he then can proceeded to invite people that he knew in the area to come and have a party and they play music in the next room um, at like crazy clock in the morning. And I'm like, what's going on and he was chewing the cut the 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 the, the grass that i'm sure you know like it's called cuts that they eat and chew cat. Um, yeah, yeah it's a cat yeah cat yeah. and they um they and he was kind of a little bit uh yeah off his face a little bit uh and i was like this guy's gonna have to drive behind me in about five hours time in the morning uh I've really is this gonna happen um unfortunately it worked out okay and we had a different driver um but there was lots of military and big tanks and things that went past us. And I, at one point I said, oh, I just need to do another mile or so up here before we can finish. And he said, no, you can't do it there. There's already been people that have been like, driving past and looking at you as if to say, like, we can, we can get him, we can mug him. Um, and so when, when that happens, you just want to leave. You just want to go. <laughs> so there was lots of, uh, yeah, lots of tensions in that one, but um that was I was already you know nearly two years into the, the experiencing the, the world, so um, I was ready for that stuff, but um, not quite ready for Yemen. And so to finish off, where where was your final marathon? Was it in the UK or was and did is Kevin was Kevin still alive? Yeah, so amazingly, Kevin was diagnosed um, and given two years to live. It took me two years to plan the trip, and so technically by science they were saying that he probably wouldn't be alive by the time i started not only was he alive when we started but he was also alive when i finished and we crossed the finish line together hand in hand with him running a marathon with me in athens the famous marathon to athens marathon the, the, the marathon of marathons uh and so that was our finish line on november the 10th and amazingly kevin is not only still alive but doing very very well um the sad reality though with terminal prostate cancer is it is terminally will kill him. Um, and he is still on a, on a clock. There's on his website. He has years since he was diagnosed and I think he's on six years now. Um, wow. and just phenomenal. And that's, that's science that has done that. Um, but it's still very sad that one day we'll know that those drugs will stop working and that the next set of drugs will stop working. And then that will be it, unfortunately. Um, but having them there at the finish line, in Athens, not just him, but loads of people that had ran with me. I've got a great friend who used to work with called Andy, who came out uh, individually across those two, 23 months and did 19 marathons with me just whenever he could. An odd weekend, he'd come out and run, um, which was amazing. He was there, loads of people that planned it. Um, my parents, girlfriend, loads of people from all over the world that had helped host me. Um, and they came to Athens to see me, to see me run and celebrate. And uh, it was probably one of the greatest days of my life for loads of different reasons and it was also quite weird to have the feeling of sadness to finish all that time I'd wanted to finish because I wanted to get the mission done and achieve the goal and then it's done I'm like I've literally run out of countries I can't I can't go and run in another country because there isn't anymore um uh, and yet then you also have the understanding that the world is so much 
bigger, more so large that you could never run everywhere, even if you had a thousand years, you know, it's just so big. Uh, and so I'm now hence going after all of these other journeys and running across countries that I want to go and see more of. Yeah, the old cliche term, it's not the destination, it's the journey. It's so true, though. It's cliched, but it is so true. We even said that, girlfriend and I, Nikki, we were saying that whilst we were driving back from the Alps and we were talking about, you know, the first year we've had in the van and experiencing it. And we had a nightmare getting back over on the tunnel, by the way. And we got back and we we're like, you know what? That was a great journey. We will, we will always remember that journey. So um, that's the same with running the world and, and everything else we've done. So there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. With yep. the first being, what's the one gadget on your trip that you always take with you? That's actually quite an easy one. It is an international extension lead, which is very boring, but incredibly practical. Um, anybody that has stayed in dorms or hostels or basically rubbish hotels, you need an extension cable. <laughs> um, because you've got a lot to charge, especially for running. You need your watch, you need your sat phone, you need your uh, your own phone, you need everything to work. And so um, an extension cable, as sad as it is. What is your favourite adventure or travel book? Oh, there's a fantastic book called Jupiter Travels. Um, it is a chap who rode around the world on his motorbike. This was in the 60s. Um, and it's, he wrote it as he went and he, uh, released it recently. Um, and I was recommended it through Penguin who I published through and they said, just read this cause this is a great book. And I, it's just fantastic, incredibly raw and real experiences of, of traveling the world when, when in a time when very few people did. Um, why are adventures important to you? They teach you perspective, context, enhance your empathy. They make you value you uh, and everything you have around you um and they realize you realize how big and how small the world is all in one go um it's it's amazing how, how did you think um this trip did change you it gave me uh temporarily gave me patience uh, during the trip and then you very quickly become impatient uh, but it also it also gave me the uh, a second wind of uh, like the lust for life, if you like. I think you know, in a Western civilization, we all get very, very bogged down with, oh, I haven't, I don't know, my friends going on holiday there, or I'm not in a job that's earning this much money, or I haven't got this car, I haven't got this TV, I can't afford that phone, or oh, she's prettier than me, or loads of these things. And when you see the world just in its raw, fantastic form you go, you know what, I am so lucky. <laughs> so, so lucky. Um, so I think it's just appreciating my, my own privilege. Um, what is your favourite quote or motivational quote? I like, don't count the days, make the days count. Um, because it doesn't really matter how long we live for, it matters what we're doing in that time. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> Um, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend them to get started? Oh, a, well, an, ob an object or an item or a, a, a method. What's um, well, what, anything like um, anything. Yeah. get started? Yeah, yeah. Um, to, I think to have true adventure, um, you've got to kind of embody the misadventures. So try and plan something that you want to do. Let's say. You usually go on holiday to the south of France or to Spain. Why don't you pick a place that you've never heard of and go there? Um, I think it's about kind of getting out of your comfort zone in the travel. Because a lot of people say to me, oh, yeah, I've traveled quite a lot. And they mean they've gone to the same four or five places a lot. Um, but I, I have learned much more from anything in any part of my life by going to the places that I'd never heard of. Um, you know, like the, some of the Pacific Islands or some of the Central African countries or literally anywhere <laughs> you know mongolia like you know, people know of mongolia mongolia but the cultures and the way of life there is just, and the beauty of the country is phenomenal um so yeah, just go out and see as much as you can yeah um what are you doing now and how can people follow you in your future adventures yeah so what am i doing now um i am planning to we're literally i'm not told many people this actually um 
12th of April, we are about to start running my next challenge, um, which is to run Britain. In the very essence of adventure, uh, I realise it's rather foolish of me to have seen every country and have not actually ran around my own country. Uh, and so in the celebration of kind of coming out of lockdown life, um, we start on the 12th of April and we finish on the 21st of July. Uh, and it is all about me pushing myself harder than I have. We are raising money for the 196 Foundation, which is the foundation I set up from running the world. Um, and that's going to help people all over the world. For We ask for small donations of £1.96 uh, per month from individuals everywhere. And that money goes into a pot. And we've developed this process called the uh, democratic donorship, where people that vote, that, that donate, get to vote on who we help um, once a year. Um, and so that could be buying a wheelchair for a, a neighbour that needs it, or whether it be building a school in Uganda, for example. So there's like the whole spectrum of, of courses that we support. So we're, we're doing Britain, running Britain. I'm trying to break the world record. The current people run around the country in about 300 days, or uh, walk or, or run it. Um, I'm trying to run around the country uh, in 100 days, which means doing two marathons a day for 100 days. So that's going to be tough. Um, but we're also going to celebrate with everybody. We're going to raise the money for the charity. Um, and that's that's coming soon. So that's what's happening very soon. I've got loads of plans. We're doing Japan, New Zealand, Himalayas, Malawi, et cetera, et cetera, over the, over the next couple of years. Um, and then we've got a big thing in 2023. In terms of getting involved, I mean, I've got a, an increasing band of brilliant people that volunteer their time. We have a, a team of about 13 or there's 15 of us now, um, which help with all our nonprofit stuff. We focus on three main causes within our, our kind of Nick Butter clan, if you like, which is adventure, community and uh, environment. So if you're in, interested in all that sort of stuff combined, then get in touch. Um, we have a free your footprint campaign, which is all about the environment. And so I'm learning more about that over the next few years and getting more people involved. Um, so getting in touch with me, the easiest way is to go onto the website, um, nickbutter.com, nickbutter.com, and just email me, which is nick at nickbutter.co.uk, um, or get me on WhatsApp, which is nickbutterrun, uh, sorry, on, on Instagram, which is nickbutterrun, and on WhatsApp, my number is on there as well. You can WhatsApp me, um, come and run with me, get involved in the projects. If you need any coaching or training, we help with that as well. Um, basically, anything that's running and fun and doing some good, then um, we're trying to do it. Oh, absolutely amazing. So how much did you raise at the end of it then? We raised, so we're still raising. It's kind of, it's never, I'm, I'm purposely not closing it because the more and more people hear about it, like, like you know, shows through like yourself, um, trying to raise more and more. We've got to just over 220,000 that we know is happened. So m many of that actually is offline donations that haven't gone through the Just Giving page, and frustratingly, but um, we've had lots of people say, oh yeah, we've given this money and it's kind of all accumulated to about 220, uh, which is great. Um, but I think by the end of this year, we'll probably be up at, at 250, um, which was our original target. Um, and I think we did pretty well considering that many of the countries I was going through, obviously nobody from those places can afford to donate. And so therefore most of the donations came from people watching my journey from afar, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and to show that, that, that gratitude, I suppose I put everybody's name that donated uh, in the back of the book to say, thank you. So there's some, I think it's about four or 5,000 names in there that, um, that people have, people have donated. So thank you to everybody that did. It's, uh, we managed to do it. We, we completed our mission. Um, and now it's time to, to get on with the next one. Well, your book is on on the website, uh, so you can buy it at my website if um, for anyone who wants to read it. And yeah, go check them out on Instagram. Thank you so much, mate. That's, uh, I, I'm really grateful for that. And uh, I think, again, a lot of people may assume and take it for granted that you are enabling people like me to have a platform and a voice to share what we're doing. Um, so, so thank you to you as well. No worries. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I sort of feel like we haven't even scratched the surface of your trip. <laughs> um, I think there's a hundred more stories to get through. I mean, we didn't even touch on Africa really, uh, no, or South America or America or anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to it. Very much. Indeed. Thank you, mate. Um, absolute pleasure to chat. Please do get in touch with me yourself directly and we'll get some running done another time or get you involved in some of the, the trips we've got coming up. But, yeah. yeah, well, that sounds great. Well, Nick, thank you so much for everything and coming on the show. No, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.